All right, continuing with our Regents Review videos, that is going to be Unit 4, Bonding. Okay, chemical compounds. formed when atoms bond together. Very important phrase to remember, barf. Okay. Breaking a bond absorbs energy. So it's endothermic. Forming a bond releases energy. So it's exothermic. So barf, break, absorb, release, form. Remember that? You can't go wrong. All right, so as we talked about in Unit 3, there are two major categories of compounds, ionic and molecular, a.k.a. covalent compounds, are the two categories. All right, so we have to remember certain things about each of them. Ionic substances, okay, they're going to have high melting points, high boiling points. They tend to form crystals. They dissolve and dissociate, don't forget that, in water. Okay? And then they're going to be electrolytes. They conduct electricity when they're a liquid and when they're dissolved in water, aqueous. Covalent molecular substances tend to have lower melting point, lower boiling points, and they do not conduct electricity. Okay. It's worth talking about metals at this point. Oh, actually, let's go back and remind us. Right? Ionic, we should know by now, we have a metal bonded with a non-metal. Okay? Or, remember, you could have a positive polyatomic ion with a non-metal, or a metal bonded with a negative polyatomic ion, or even a positive polyatomic ion bonded with a negative polyatomic ion. Molecular covalent is going to be non-metal with a non-metal. Okay? We have metal, so if you just have a big old lump of iron, you have metallic bonding. The key phrase to remember there is a C of mobile electrons. Okay, they conduct electricity because electrons can move. The reason why ionic substances can conduct electricity is because the ions can move. Okay, so conducting electricity is all about the movement of charge. Okay. Uh, like dissolves like. Polar and ionic solvents, I'm sorry, solutes, dissolve in polar solvents. Okay, water is our common example for a polar solvent. So other polar substances or ionic substances can dissolve in water. Non-polar solutes dissolve in non-polar solvents. 
Our examples of both of these would be different uh, organic substances. Uh, I mean, you've heard the phrase, I'm sure, oil and water don't mix. Oil is nonpolar, water is polar. And that's why they don't mix. Okay. So, a little more about chemical bonds. You have to remember, ionic is transfer of electrons. For example, if we have sodium with one electron, chlorine with seven, sodium gives this electron to the chlorine, and we end up with Na plus bonded to a Cl minus, and they stick to each other because of the opposite's in charge, but it's a transfer of electrons. This electron is completely given away. To remember that covalent bonds are shared. So for water, right, we have oxygen, which has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons, bonded with two hydrogens, each having one. Okay. Now, I do this, the oxygen is happy because it has eight valence electrons. The hydrogen is happy because it has two valence electrons. These electrons are being shared by the hydrogen and the oxygen. These electrons are being shared by this hydrogen and the oxygen. Okay, so covalent molecular is all about shared electrons. Each of these is a single bond, and we can draw them like so, with a single line. You have to remember that a line here is a single bond. It's one pair or two electrons. You can also have double bonds. Let's see, double bonded with O, for example. Each of these double bonds, there's one, two pair or four electrons. So there's two pair of electrons here, two pair of electrons here. If the question asks how many pairs of electrons are shared between a carbon and an oxygen, two pair or four electrons. You always have to pay close attention to the question. Uh, you can have a triple bond. Right? So a triple bond there's three shared pair or six electrons. Okay, we have to remember that metals tend to lose electrons, form positive ions with a smaller radius. So the ionic radius is smaller than the atomic radius. Nonmetals tend to gain electrons, form negative ions with a larger radius. Okay, so the ionic radius is larger when it's negative. Now the whole reason why they either gain or lose electrons or share is they are seeking a stable electron configuration, which is eight valence electrons, except for hydrogen and helium are seeking two valence electrons for their stable electron configuration. A reminder about Lewis dot structures, right, if we do calcium, right, calcium is a group two, so it has two valence electrons, and the first two go together. If we're going to draw fluorine, group 17, so it has seven valence electrons, 
one, two, the first two go together, and then after that they want to spread out. So one, two, three, four, five, spread out, six, seven. Oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon, one, two, three, four. Electronegativity. The fancy definition is how strongly an atom of an element attracts electrons in a chemical. Easy definition is just its affinity for electrons. So something that's more electronegative wants electrons more. Something that's elec less electronegative wants electrons less. All right. Intermolecular forces. All right, those are going to be the forces between molecules. So the forces of attraction between molecules. Now, it's not an intermolecular force, but the strongest force of attraction is going to be ionic. I'm just going to put a little asterisk around here because that's not an intermolecular force. However, there's very strong forces of attraction in ionic substances. Now, getting to our intermolecular forces, the strongest one we learned about was hydrogen bonding. As I've said multiple times on videos and in class, it's not a real bond. Okay, it's an attraction. So a better name would have been hydrogen attractions, but they call it hydrogen bonding, so we're stuck with it. Right? So in order to have hydrogen bonding, you need hydrogen and polar molecules. Okay? Water is a good example. Right? Water is a polar molecule because we have polar bonds. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So this bond is polar. Also, the molecule is asymmetrical, leading to a polar molecule. So you can have polar bonds and polar molecules. We need to remember SNAP, symmetrical polar, asymmetrical nonpolar. So since it's <laughs> symmetrical nonpolar, asymmetrical polar, symmetrical nonpolar, asymmetrical polar. I should probably be smart and edit that out, but eh. Snap, symmetrical, nonpolar, asymmetrical, polar. So what happens here when we get hydrogen bonding, since the hydrogen end is positive and the oxygen end is negative, the hydrogen, the positive hydrogen ends attracted to the negative oxygen end. And this attraction here is hydrogen bonding. It's a f the strongest of the intermolecular forces. Next, we have dipole. dipole. And that's the attraction between polar molecules. Polar. And finally, London dispersion forces, or simply dispersion forces. And that's the attraction, the momentary attraction between nonpolar molecules. And the important thing to remember about dispersion forces, it's stronger in larger molecules. For example, when we look at our periodic table, 
right? There's two liquids on the periodic table at STP, mercury and bromine. Now, when we look here at group 17, right, these are all part of, these four are part of Brinkelhoff's, where in nature we only see F2, Cl2, Br2, or I2. So since they're molecules, there is going to be dispersion forces. Iodine is a solid at STP because it has the strongest dispersion forces because it's going to be the biggest. That's the largest atomic radius, so it'll be the biggest molecule. Bromine is a liquid. Okay, It's smaller than iodine but larger than chlorine. It has stronger intermolecular forces than chlorine but weaker intermolecular forces than iodine. Therefore, it's a liquid. Chlorine and fluorine have weaker intermolecular forces than bromine and iodine. Therefore, they're both gases. Now, these intermolecular forces okay, affect things like uh, melting point and boiling point and hardness, etc. So the stronger intermolecular forces the higher boiling point and melting point. The weaker the intermolecular forces, the lower the boiling point and melting point. And one other thing that I haven't talked about in quite some time, having you guys write down, are our Brinkelhoffs. This is just another point to remember. That bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine all exist as diatomic molecules in nature. The thing to remember is that they are diatomic molecules when they are by themselves. Okay? So you can have, right, H2O. O is not diatomic here, but it is not by itself. Okay, so it's don't make that common mistake, but you got to remember your Brinkelhoffs. All right, that brings us to the end of Unit 4 review. See you guys in school.